In the past few years, there's been a lot of talk about America losing its standing in the world, economically, diplomatically, grammatically. <laughs> but yesterday, the U.S. showed there's at least one place they can still kick ass. It was a day of record-setting domination on the world stage for the U.S. women. As the Women's World Cup kicks off in France, the U.S. women's soccer team is showing no mercy and making history. 2 nothing U.S. It's 3 nothing. The defending champions posting the tournament's largest margin of victory ever, shutting out Thailand 13 to nothing. Wow! 13 to nothing! That's not a soccer score. America basically won by a touchdown, a field goal, and a three-pointer combined. Like, they were dominating so hard, this was their goalie during the game. And it's crazy, because if you watch soccer in the world, you're like, this is madness. Americans were like, this is how soccer should be! <laughs> I do feel a little bad, though, right? Because this is the worst thing to ever happen to a Thai soccer team. And yes, I'm including the one that got stuck in the cave. <laughs> yeah, because at least the cave wasn't celebrating in front of them. You guys are stuck in me! <laughs> so, this was a historic win for the U.S. women's soccer team. But some people say it might have been a little too much winning. A lot of controversy over how the women of Team USA celebrated over that record-breaking win over Thailand. Critics say the team showed poor sportsmanship by continuing to score, then celebrate. Some calling Team USA's behavior embarrassing, overboard, and disrespectful. That target that they already had on their back as defending champions, that just got a whole lot bigger. They have now painted themselves as villains and as bullies. Okay. I get what people are saying, right? They're saying that the U.S. beat this team so hard they should have been more sensitive, not celebrating every single goal. But I mean, at the same time, sometimes taking pity can be worse than celebrating. You know, it's patronizing. Like, imagine you're in a rap battle and you're losing, and then the other MC's like, and another thing! Wait, wait, are you okay? Oh, <laughs> I totally crushed you with that line about your mama. Hey, I, I can talk if you need... Do you want a hug? Do you want a hug? <laughs> so the big question is... Has this tarnished the reputation of U.S. women's soccer? Well, for more on this, we're joined by someone who's embarrassed America many times while overseas. Desi Lydic, everybody! <laughs> Desi... <laughs> People are saying the U.S. women's soccer team was unsportsmanlike. Do you yeah. agree? No, no. They were not being unsportsmanlike, Trevor. They were being American. Our slogan is America f yeah! Not... <laughs> Not America. Oh, sorry, we won. We're the country that won a war 200 years ago, and we're still shooting off fireworks to rub it in Britain's face. So, so you're saying it's not arrogance. That's just how America rolls. Exactly. It's how we roll on the battlefield. It's how we roll on the soccer field. It's how we roll at our daughter's piano recital, which she totally f won, by the way. Desi, I don't think you can win a piano recital. No, you do if all the other parents' cars get their tires slashed. <laughs> and suddenly, orchestra night becomes Tiffany night. I love you, sweetie. You made Beethoven your bitch. Okay, you're a good mom, I guess, Desi. Uh, but, but don't you feel even a little bad for Thailand's team? What? Thailand? No, this has nothing to do with them. Our women weren't playing against Thailand. They were playing against the patriarchy. That's what this game was really about. Well, last time I checked, the patriarchy wasn't made up of 13 Thai women. No, 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 no. no. I'm talking about this. 28 players are suing their employer, the U.S. Soccer Federation, alleging institutionalized gender discrimination. According to their lawsuit, the women's team earns just 38% of a male player for the same kind of work. The women scored more goals in one match than the men's team has scored in every World Cup appearance since 2006 combined. You see that? The women's soccer team is doing so much more and getting paid so much less than the men's team. It's like finding out that Tony Stark got paid less than Hawkeye. One's a superhero, the other's a dad who's into archery. <laughs> Yesterday was about the women's team trying to prove their worth. They weren't just playing to win a game, they were playing to win a lawsuit. And yeah, you know what? It, it sucks that Thailand had to get caught in the crossfire, but it's like I said to the parents at my kids' music school. It's not personal, and I'll pay for your tires. So, so you're saying the women's team was just sending a message to U.S. soccer? Yes. And clearly that message was that they need to be paid more. 
Oh, and uh, I don't know, maybe U.S. soccer should pay the men less. Maybe they'd then be motivated to actually qualify for their World Cup. Goal! Yeah! Goal! 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 Yes! I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be like, Desi Lydic, everyone, we'll be right back. about women's soccer players. They're the big stars in the States with all the money and the glory of the men. Well, except for the money part, as Hassan Minaj reports. Superstar athletes have the life. We're talking cars, jets, even their pet albino tigers get cars. But not all pro athletes are happy with the big bucks. In fact, the women's soccer team is taking legal action because they want more. Players on the U.S. women's national soccer team say they're being discriminated against because they make less than members of the men's team. Filed a federal complaint against the U.S. Soccer Federation. I sat down with three members of the U.S. women's soccer team to find out why they're being so greedy. We're not being greedy. We're just fighting for what's right. Our contributions to the Federation should be seen as equal to what the men have done. Fine. Whatever. But you need to understand that the men made it to the round of 16 in the World Cup. Well, we've won three World Cups. Well, they are ranked 30th in the world. We're ranked number one. Um, they play with so much passion. We have four Olympic gold medals. Humble brags, okay. But how much less could their pay possibly be? If we win a match, we get $1,300. The men, they get around $17,000. Whoa. If the men's team loses, they make $5,000. Five Jeez, if you lose. Could you imagine having that much money? Can't really imagine it because we don't get paid anything if we lose. Maybe that's why you guys don't lose. Silver lining. <laughs> kidding me? Why don't you guys just pick up second jobs? Uber driving. After your guys' games, surge pricing will definitely be high. Boom, you're driving fans home at 1.5, maybe 2, 3x. I don't have time to go be an Uber driver. We put in our time to win gold medals for this team. While the U.S. Soccer Federation has their own interpretation of the pay differences, the bottom line is the women want them to level the playing field. Oh, and they also want them to literally level the playing field. They're constantly forced to play on AstroTurf, even at the World Cup, something that the men's team has never had to do. They don't play on turf. Not one game. Others would argue that the women's soccer team should be grateful just to play. Like Gavin McGinnis. Sure, he looks like an art school dropout with a Shins cover band, but he has his own show and is a Fox News contributor. Women do earn less in America because they choose to. Yep, not surprisingly, he thinks the women's lawsuit is a waste of time. Men's soccer has been getting 10 times the eyeballs. You know what? I'm gonna let the ladies handle this one. Well, we actually yeah. broke the record for the most watched. watched soccer game in the history of America between men or women. You're playing a man's game by man's rules? This is the way it is in our world. You gotta earn it. No. We've brought in, what, 17 million this past year? The so, men lost $2 million in profit for the Federation this last year. U.S. men's soccer still gets a lot more enthusiasm. Now, why is that? Is that because men's soccer is more interesting, more exciting? Gavin, you're down 2 nothing. You know what, let me try to help you. Name three U.S. men's soccer players. Current, we have Bobby Daniels. Bobby Daniels, okay, let's check the list. <laughs> nope, not a player. Ziggler. Norris. Also not a player. And a guy we known to everyone as Junebug. Come on, man. If you're gonna make up fake names, do better than Junebug. If lunatics like this are against the women, who's on their side? Billie Jean King. 100%. I mean, she's done so much for women's sports. Who's that? Tennis player? I don't, I don't. Tennis star Billie Jean King has long been campaigning for women's rights. Damn. Turns out Billie Jean King is a badass tennis player, but also she paved the way for equal pay in tennis when she defeated Bobby Riggs in the 1973 Battle of the Sexes. Let me get this straight. Mm. All you did was defeat a man and now you have equal pay in tennis. Problem solved. <laughs> it wasn't easy peasy, man. When I played Bobby Riggs, mm -hmm. that was about social change. Our ratio of prize money was about eight to one, and I think the women's soccer is four to one. And I know what you're gonna say. Progress. Improvement. Yeah. Improvement's not enough. We're supposed to be so happy if we get one crumb. Oh, thank you. I am so grateful. 
You're we deserve the cake, the icing, and the cherry on top, too, just like the boys. So let's put some cleats on you. You play the men, and let's get them ladies paid. You're missing the point. Okay. I will play the women. Do you honestly think you can keep up with the women's soccer players? Seriously. We will do a battle of the sexes, BJK style, because it worked for tennis. No. no. We'd crush you. Bobby Riggs was a champion in his sport. We didn't even know who you were until today. Um, I played two years at AOISO when I was in the fourth grade. And I have also won trophies for effort. This is definitely a different level than that. OK, fine. So the battle of the sexes is a bad idea. What else can we do? People have to get to know us. So we need to really get behind women, get behind them with money, exposure, give them more commercials. A commercial, yes. I can see it now. You can defy the odds. The odds. I became one of the best players in the world at the age of 17. You can be great. Great. I scored a game-winning PK in a World Cup. You can make history. history. We won three World Cups and four Olympic gold medals. You can aspire to be less than. Less than. Wait, what did you say? You can be just as good as any other person, as long as that person doesn't have a penis. A penis. Are you kidding me? And for all that hard work, you can make four times less than a man. I don't think so. You can treat us equally. You can give us grass to play on. You can pay us what we deserve. Just, Just do it. it. Please do it. My guest tonight is a two-time Olympic gold medalist and FIFA Women's World Cup champion. She's also an activist and best-selling author whose latest book is called Wolfpack, How to Come Together, Unleash Our Power, and Change the Game. Please welcome Abby Wambach. Innovation. You have an amazing audience. You, you pay them well. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they will be receiving that money I promised them. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you. And uh, congratulations on the book. Let's talk about the book because it really speaks about everything that you've done in your life and everything that we deal with. Many people know you as a really successful soccer player who, uh, in many ways, led the U.S. women's soccer team to some of its greatest victories. Um, you know, your header in the World Cup against Brazil is one of the most famous ones. Um, Amazing. But, but the conversations in this book speak about many of the conversations that people are still having today about women's soccer in the U.S., and that is, why is the women's team not getting paid what they are owed? In other words, equal pay for the work that they're doing. It's insane. You know, I, I really feel like this is a, a true discrimination lawsuit that they've just filed against U.S. soccer, and... Um, I'm proud to be supporting them. But here's the thing, the big argument, right, that I hear is that the, men, the men's team brings in more money. So, of course, that's why they should deserve to make more money, but that's just not true. In 2015, the women's team brought in $6.6 .6 million, and the men's team only brought in two. If you, if you look at the book, it's based on a commencement speech that you gave that really went viral, you know, because it connected with so many people. And one of the, one of the, 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 the quotes in the book reminds me of what you said in that speech. And that was when you were looking at yourself on a stage at the ESPYs. It was yourself, and it was um, Kobe Bryant, and it was Peyton Manning. And you were all on the stage being honored as legends in your fields. And you walked off that stage, and you had a very specific thought. And that thought was... Wow, all three of us are walking into very different retirements. On stage, I was feeling this immense amount of gratitude. Like, right. wow, we women had finally made it, you know? And what, what I realized when I walked off stage is that's like basically the emotion that women are granted to feel when they are given an award, this idea of just being grateful. So for me, writing this book and trying to unpack some of these moments in my life that taught me things, I mean, that night is when I dedicated and I, I promised myself that I would dedicate myself for the rest of my life to fighting for equality, whether it be equal pay um, in my sport and in, in my, for my team, but also for every woman in, ev in every industry because... This is a fight that is necessary. And it's not necessary just because women deserve it. It's necessary for all people everywhere, right? Because our, our world feels like, I mean, you talk about all the things that seem to be on fire, right. that, that seem to be going wrong. 
And I believe that women having more access to the tables where decisions are made, um, that will help this world better, to be better. It's really interesting that you, that, that you bring that up because, and this is, this is a really interesting part of the book. It's, it's right at the beginning and, and it's just a beautiful little anecdote. You go, um, recently on a call with a company hiring me to teach about leadership, a man said, excuse me, Abby, I just need to ensure that what you present is applicable to men too. I said, good question, but only if you asked every male speaker you've hired if his message is applicable to women too. Which is a really powerful thought that you don't think about. People will often say that. They'll be like, oh, but hey, yeah. this for them. do the men understand women leadership? Yeah. Is it- well, and also, this was like a women leadership conference that I was going oh, wow. to. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> for this dude to, like, say this on the call, and I'm saving him from, from actually putting this company out in his name, but, but the reality is, like, these microaggressions happen all the time. Right. And uh, I think what we need to start doing is becoming aware of what these microaggressions are. That's what this whole book is about. Um, And then then having the courage and the language to be able to counteract some of these things that we are are interacting with in in everyday life. So me asking him that very question, my wife is the best at this. She's like, just flip it. Just flip the scenario, put yourself in their position. Yes. And and if it is not equal, then that is prejudice. That That is treating somebody less than. There's a, there's a part of the book where you specifically say, hey, if you are a man reading this book, I hope you realize this book is for you as well. Yeah. This is a message we all have to engage in. And you speak specifically about the wolves in Yellowstone, right? And it's a story many people know or don't know. It, it's about how in Yellowstone, they were struggling with overpopulation of, of deers. Right? And the deer were destroying everything. They were eating everything. They had no predator. And so the people said, we need to introduce wolves. Yeah, the river stopped running. Right. And so this decided, the, the scientists um, decided that they would reintroduce wolves into the Yellowstone National Park, Park ecosystem. And soon enough, the, the wolves, they displaced the, the deer through, through hunting. Um, and then the vegetation grew, grew back and the riverbank started to, to strengthen. And then the river started to, to run again. And so when I was giving this speech at Barnard last May, I was hoping that these Barnard graduates would get the connection between what the wolves were experiencing, like what they, you know, wolves are, were a threat to the system. And they ended up being the salvation of this right. dying ecosystem. And so too can we as women be the salvation of what's happening in our system right now. It's a really beautiful message. It's a powerful book. I'm excited for the journey that you're gonna be on. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Earlier today, I spoke with Megan Rapino, a two-time World Cup champion and Olympic gold medalist. She opened up about her activism, her success on the soccer field, and so much more. Megan Rapino, welcome to the Daily Social Distancing Show. Uh, I'm a big fan. I'm very excited to be here. This is exciting. I am a bigger fan now that I see uh, what you're wearing, because as a, as a fan of hoodies, I, uh, I am partial to the hoodie game. That's, that's a pretty dope hoodie. I like that. Yeah, it's a good one. Chinatown Market. It's, you know, nice and colorful. It's comfy. I'm probably sweating underneath, but you can't tell. <laughs> so it's fine. That's what makes hoodies the best. No one knows what's happening underneath. What matters is what you look like. That's all that matters. Welcome to the show. And before we get into it, congratulations on your recent engagements. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're, we're both very excited. You're engaged to somebody now who has a list of achievements that could only be matched by yours. So on your side, you have won two World Cups, an Olympic gold medal, one Ballon d'Or. Sue, on her side, has won four WNBA titles, four Olympic gold medals, and four FIBA World Cups. Question is, in the IKEA like bookshelf, who gets to put the trophies where? Is there like a like is there like priority? Even my mom, when we first got together, she's like, I Googled Sue and like. You're really not that impressive anymore. And I'm like, <laughs> I know, this is crazy. Um, uh, it's probably be like percentage. So I'll like have, you know, my little sliver of like 20% and then like Sue's gonna take up the rest of the, the oh, show. I like that. There's, there's no lie that there has been uh, pay disparity between people of different genders and different races, you know? In sports, it's really interesting because, you know, people always go like, oh, well, I mean, it's about income and it's about revenue. People don't go to the games as much, the women's games. That's why they don't get paid as much. It's not us. It's the fans who are not going. How do you handle that dispute? And, and, and how do you try and educate, um, you know, onlookers who are just going like, well, Megan, I don't know who's right and who's wrong in this thing. I mean, I, I understand what these owners are saying, but I understand what you are saying. How, how do you handle that side of the arguments to win people over? 
I think when in sports, we often go to like, what's your salary and how many people are watching you or how many people in the stadium. But it really starts a lot before that. You have to think of it like a business that needs to be invested in. And, you know, if the NBA is getting a billion dollars of investment, the WNBA is getting, you know, even a hundred million dollars of investment, like one business is going to be more successful. If you spend more on your marketing person and your branding person and your ticket, your CEO, and you have all these people, like the business is going to run better. So by the time we right. get to the game, we've been so uh, under invested in or at such a at such a disadvantage the whole time. Like it's shocking that we have as much success as we do, or we're as popular as we do, uh, as we are. And I think it's like. Let's understand the entire picture before we just go to the very last stage and be like, well, uh -huh. see, no one wants to come. I also love that your fight has inspired other women. And, and you talk about this in, in, in your book and you, you know, you've shared the story. Your aunt told you that she fought for her pay when she saw you fighting for yours. What was that like? And what, like, what did she do in her world that changed everything? To, to know that like she found herself in our fight um, yeah, it, it made me really emotional. It was a really touching moment. And I think that's the, probably the most rewarding and, and the most important part out of our team's fight with the Federation and the lawsuits and the equal pay fight is like, yeah, of course we're doing it on our behalf, but still in the grand scheme, like we're so privileged. We still make a lot of money. We're still like superstars of some, some kind, but for so many women out there, like it's my aunt in, in her job. It's, you know, a, a domestic worker or it's a restaurant worker. It's, like, it's so right. difficult to do these things. Even in our position, it's difficult. So to know that we've inspired or at least made people think, you know, down to um, every single level is like, that's the, the biggest win I think that we could have. The title of your newly released memoir is One Life, which I think is very misleading because I feel like you've lived many lives. You share so many inspiring, heartfelt and painful experiences from your journey, you know? Um, I mean, just some of the stories that stick out for me is, you know, the moment when you realize that your dad is a Trump supporter and yourself and your twin sister who are both gay say, hey, this, this breaks our hearts and, and you, you have to deal with that with somebody that you love. Do you have any tips or tricks on how to mend the wounds between family members who've been ripped apart because of politics? Mm -hmm. I just try to, to keep talking. I, I still like obviously have this relationship. I love him. And while it's it's painful, of course, um, and it was painful to know that, you know, he would have voted for someone like that and, and supported him for a lot of years. Um, I don't think he voted for him this year, which which I'm thankful for. Um, but it's like we can't just not talk to each other. I mean, it's it's obviously a tough time for everyone right now, knowing it's that it was 71 million people or something voted for someone who's just spewed hatred and chaos and disaster. And we have, you know, approaching 250,000 people dead from COVID and all of these things to, to know that someone supports that, but like that clearly there's much more to it that, um, I think we need to dig into and have more conversation with just as family, as friends, as a nation, as everybody. I thank you for sharing, um, your book, truly, truly, truly is something that I think everybody should read. They're going to love you even more. You're going to be, um, you're going to have even more fans and you're probably going to have to build like an extra trophy cabinet because of all the awards the book is probably going to win as well. So tell Sue to make some space for those extra trophies and uh, congrats on the hoodie. Thank you so much for joining me, Megan. I appreciate you. Thank you.